So let me just go, just uh, th that I've been doing this piece now for almost 20 years, since 1967. It was originally the first work when it was committed, co commissioned by the uh, student government at Rutgers in Newark, when I was working at Rutgers in Newark. And, uh, uh, and I've been doing it, I've done it hundreds of times in all parts of the United States, and even had a couple of quick forays into Europe with it. So, and I, you know, I, I don't know how many, I've lost track of how many times I've performed it, but I, I would guess 300, 400, somewhere in there. And, uh, and uh, you know, John Brown is a, uh, you know, it's simply a soul mate of mine that and I've been privileged for all these years to carry around the spirit of John Brown in this body. And uh, uh, it's been a privilege to, to represent him. So, okay, we're all set. So the name of the play is John Brown, Trumpet of Freedom. And my the collaborator is George Wolf Riley. He's going through a bad patch of bad health right now. Bless his heart. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. But his truth goes marching on. They hung his body from a sour apple tree. They hung his body from a sour apple tree. They hung his body from a sour apple tree. But his truth goes marching on. What are we willing to give our lives to? What are we willing to, go, to give our lives for? How fiercely should we resist evil? Can we be corrupted by our own righteousness? What would you do? If you were living in the United States in the 1850s and you sincerely desired to take an action against slavery, what would you do? Would you go listen to another moral suasionist speech from Frederick Douglass or William Lloyd Garrison? Or would you work for the election of Abraham Lincoln? None of those people had any idea of ending slavery. John Brown hated slavery with every fiber of his heart, his soul, and his body. And because And because his body followed so faithfully the urgings of his heart and soul, he ended his brief term upon this earth, swinging by the neck at the end of a hangman's rope. John Brown dreamed one great dream, a dream of freedom and brotherhood. And because he stood steadfastly, simply, and unflinchingly for that dream, the earth shifted on its axis. We begin. The time is early morning, December the 2nd, 1859. John Brown composes a farewell letter to his abolitionist compatriots. Just a little later this morning, it will be my privilege to hang by the neck until dead. Many have called me a terrorist. That is incorrect. I have always fought against terrorists, bullies who brutalize those unable to defend themselves. The fact is, is that I acted against only those who worked for the promulgation of slavery and the destruction of me and members of my family. I no never took action against a single soul who held no criminal intent. In doing so, a few criminals lost their lives whereas the actual terrorists enslaved, tortured, raped, and murdered multiplied millions of African people over the last 250 years, and they have the temerity to call me a madman. 
They say I made war on the United States in the state of Virginia. You must understand something. Slavery is war. It is a state of total war against those who are enslaved and thus anything done to end it is justified in the name of war. When will I reach that heavenly place and be forever blessed? When will I see my father's face and in his bosom rest? My father was a good and faithful servant of God and people said that he was eccentric because he prayed aloud and stuttered when he spoke. Well, I shared his love of God's holy word. Now, prizing the pleasures of the world of the spirit was the great gift that my father gave to me. His lessons have stayed with me all my life. What is the good of eating food whose flavor is a delight to the senses if it distracts from the greater delights of the gifts of God? It became my practice to bathe every morning of the winter in cold water. Often I would find the water in the basin frozen, and I would break through the ice and proceed with my washing. And in so doing, I learned to concentrate my mind so completely on the spirit that my body became superfluous. My father saw to it that I worked hard as a boy. I traveled a great deal selling cattle well, I was a youth, uh, newly arrived on the threshold of manhood, just 12 years old, and I was driving some cattle with an older man to supply the army during the War of 1812. Well, we had ridden on horseback over 200 miles through the wilderness together, and in the vast loneliness of such a journey, strangers can become quite close. And by the end of that trek, we had become fast friends. When we had sold our cattle in return, he invited me to his home, and I was an honored guest, and he made much of me to his wife and children, and praised me greatly to his friends and family. I had never before seen an African. Chained to a post in their yard, they kept a black slave, a boy just like me. He didn't even have whiskers on his face. He was naked and half starved and it was obvious he could not live through the winter. They made him sleep outside in the bitter cold with only a thin blanket to cover him. I heard the kind voices of my companion and his family turn harsh with abuse as they ridiculed and tormented this poor slave. They whipped him savagely for the slightest infraction and fed him only the most vile scraps, rotting garbage that even their hogs would have refused to eat. Once, when they caught him stealing a bit of decent food, I saw him beaten with an iron shovel until blood gushed from his wounds. I became sick at the sight of it, but this man was unabashed in his cruelty. He said to me, <laughs> hey, son, you got to remember that a nigger ain't nothing but a two-legged mule. If you don't whip them, they start to thinking that they're your master. <laughs> now, I hope you have a, maybe you'll have a few slaves working for you when you grow up. Now, I hope you remember this lesson so you'll know how to treat them the right way when the time comes. <laughs> to my everlasting shame, I did nothing to stop it. Well, I prayed to God to ease his torment, but even as I did, I knew it would not help him because my hosts, like many in America, had hardened their hearts to the plight of these poor lost souls. And though they mouthed the piety as a God's revealed word, their behavior was far from that which Christ preached. But what astonished me most and drove a burning stake through my heart was that no matter how brutally they abused this poor wretch, Miserable as he was, he never cried out for mercy or pity, but he endured it all with a dignity that was beyond my comprehension. Tears welled up in my eyes and I was filled with righteous anger, and in that moment, my mission was revealed to me. 
I prayed for guidance and the Lord shucked the scales from my eyes. A pure white light burned a scar across my soul and in a blinding vision I saw my destiny. That night I faced God and asked, Are you not his father also? His answer set the course for my life. It would be many years before I could act on my revelation, but in that moment I knew that I would change the course of the history of the nation. I, John Brown, would fight for the freedom of a people that I hardly knew. God had spoken to me and commanded me to scourge the world of this iniquity, this scheme of the devil, this slavery. I was called to be the trumpet of freedom for the black slave, the weapon of God's wrath, the sword of his vengeance. From that terrible moment, I became the most ardent abolitionist in America. However, many abolitionists did not have pure hearts. Some opposed this so-called peculiar institution of chattel slavery only because they saw it as unfair competition for white workers and businessmen. God made it clear to me that these Africans were my brothers and sisters, my equals in his eyes. And despite jeers and ridicule for most white people, I address blacks as sir or ma'am. Even Abraham Lincoln believed blacks to be inferior to whites. He expressed this opinion many times. He once said, uh, boys, the Negro is not my equal in any respect. I am not now nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. There is a physical difference between the white and the black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races from living together on terms of social and political equality. But while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Lincoln is a fool. I am different. That the African has been enslaved and denied even the most basic education makes him ignorant compared to me, but give him the same advantages that I have enjoyed, and in a twinkling, he will become my equal in every respect. To the work, to the work, there is labor for all. For the kingdom of darkness and here I shall fall and the name of Jehovah exalted shall be with a triumphant cry every man shall be free toiling on toiling on toiling on toiling on let us work let us trust and labor till the master comes so I created a training facility at the Kennedy Farm in Weston, Maryland for the militia of escaped slaves we envisioned flocking to us. Now the first campaign of this militia was the raid on the Harpers Ferry Arsenal. I had such high hopes for success there. Now my strategy was to seize the munitions with which to supply a freedom highway, a chain of armed strongholds in the Allegheny Mountains to facilitate the escape of slaves and ease their journey along the Underground Railroad. Now this should have happened and it would have happened had I not been deserted at this critical hour by some of my so-called allies in the abolitionist movement. Frederick Douglass. He was a cautious man. He said to me, too risky, John. Too risky. I'm not willing to hazard all on one reckless throw of the dice. I'm eternally tired of that word caution. It is nothing more than the word of cowardice. Now your zeal in the cause of my race is in some respects greater than my own. Now, I am willing to live for the slave, but you 
are willing to die for them. Now, my people want freedom, but I believe they are generally averse to suicide, which is what your attack on Harper's Ferry will be. Too risky. Too risky. As if freeing a nation of slaves is not worth any risk the struggle demands. William Lloyd Garrison, pious newspaper man, all full of pretty sermons. I believe in the power of moral suasion to bring about emancipation. Not by the sword shall your deliverance be, not by the shedding of blood. My way will save lives, not destroy them. It is better that an entire generation of men, women, and children pass away by violent death than any violation of the Holy Gospel be further tolerated. For well, my theology is firmly rooted in the virtues of freedom and democracy as expressed in the revolution of 1776, but I am unalterably opposed to a bloody revelation of slaves. God's time is best, even if it takes a few generations. When, it's time, when it was time for that old woman to strike a blow for freedom, you ha it r ran and hid among the petticoats. <laughs> but there was no such trepidation on the part of General Harriet Tubman. Now, they called George Washington a great general, but the greatest general I ever met was Harriet Tubman, and she was an escaped slave who couldn't read or write. Even without the privileged life enjoyed by Washington, she still could have bested him in any contest. She is a small woman, thin, gray-headed, wrinkled. She is bravery personified. I have never seen courage so perfectly expressed in human form, man or woman, black or white. She freed more than 300 slaves, and I once asked her, how come she had freed so many? weren't nothing to it, I could have freed 300 more if they had known they were slaves. I just used half the sense the Lord blessed me with and trusted him, so I don't have to worry about losing my nerve. I just come to the place where I'm going to do my business. I walk right down the main street, see if any mischief going on. Nobody looked twice at the old colored lady all bent leaning on a stick. I always do my business in the wintertime. White people think slaves too trifling to run off in the cold weather. So I just get the word to the folks that we gonna set free and then on the darkest, coldest, Saturday night we can find, yeah, there we go. Old man, you get them guns out of the fair and I'll send you a hundred wagon loads of colored boys to shoot them. <laughs> Had she been present, the outcome at Harper's Ferry would have been very different. Well, without the rallying cry of a great black leader, such as Frederick Douglass or General Tubman, why should uh, slaves trust me, an old white man with a dream? So I invaded Harper's Ferry with uh, a 19-man army and a wagon load of sharpened pikes for the regiment of escaped slaves who were supposed to join us in the mountains. But alas, that was not to be. Darkest night of sin has settled, loud the angry billows roar, eager eyes are watching longing for the lights along the shore. O oh Lord, as we step forth on this hallowed mission, allow us to be thy instrument to bring thy judgment down upon this nation of evildoers. For we come not to bring peace, but a sword. Amen. On an October evening, my men and I set off walking from the Kennedy farm. And we marched that dark night to Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Before dawn, we stormed into the town and captured the arsenal, as well as several hostages. The troop consisted of five black soldiers, 13 whites, including two of my sons, and me. The newspapers got it wrong, as usual. Here I have a dispatch from the Washington Intelligencer. 
October the 18th, 1859, uh, morning edition, reported insurrection and capture of the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Today, the arsenal at Harper's Ferry was attacked by an army of abolitionist guerrillas. Reports confirm that this army consists of 250 white insurrectionists, plus a great horde of escaped slaves said to number in excess of a thousand. Most of the leading citizens have been taken prisoner and great loss of life is feared. Further details to follow. There's a glowing example of the astuteness of the gentleman of the press. Wouldn't it have been so? Had there been such a mighty force, I would not stand here a condemned man, but would rather sit here in judgment, sentencing slave-owning criminals to their glorious hour on the gallows. <coughs> well, once we had secured the arsenal, my men commenced to complain that they were hungry. Well, not even the slightest thought of food had entered my mind, but a good commander takes care of his hostages as well as his troops. So, as the daylight broke, I sent Shields Green, a very large, a very large runaway slave from South Carolina, over to the restaurant to procure breakfast. And as the proprietor, Mr. Throgmorton, later told the press, uh, <coughs> uh, "Well, gents, uh, y'all can tell y'all's readers that the first I ever heard of it." John Brown was, while I was right here uh, making the biscuits, and I heard a voice order breakfast for 58 men. 58 breakfasts. <laughs> Man, I thought I was going to make me some money that day. Well, then I seen who had called out the order, and Lord of my, there he was in my place of business, an African. Well, by then I told him he'd have to wait outside while I fried up the eggs and such. But first, he better pay for it. I mean, cash only barrel head. Well, that's more than a hundred eggs. Three months work for a hen. I couldn't take a risk on that. It wouldn't be fair to the chicken. Instead, he hands me over a note saying I was blessed to supply breakfast at my own expense. Signed by this fellow, you know, what's the name of Brown. Well, I had no more than started to decline that honor when his darkie stood up making me chin to chest about the fiercest looking coon I ever seen all three four different states I never traveled to. <laughs> he had a horn handled dagger lashed to his leg and a piece of chain he kept twirling around so tall as he was he looked like a dead blame windmill. And to top it off he was toting a sprang field rifle with a bayonet on it so sharp that when a skeeter tried to light on it <laughs> Sliced in half. <laughs> well, about that time, I guess I didn't saw the light. Hallelujah, boy! You tell your <laughs> Captain Brown that I proudly accept that honor. <laughs> well, yes, uh, any y'all hungry? <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Throgmorton proved to be a highly intelligent man, for in the space of a very short time, he arrived with a large wheelbarrow loaded with eggs and ham, hot cakes, potatoes, and coffee, which the men and the hostages uh, fell upon with great relish. After breakfast, I sent my lieutenant, Aaron Stevens, along with John Cook, to capture Colonel Lewis Washington, the largest slave owner in the county, and a descendant of George Washington, another slave owner and the father of the slave oligarchy that has run this country from its very beginnings. And I have no use for any of the Washingtons. Well, when the colonel arrived, uh, stuffed into the back of a wagon with several of his now ex-slaves, he became quite huffy with me. <laughs> oh, now look here, son. What is the meaning of this outrage? Who are you? Captain John Brown, the sword of Jehovah, and his avenger of those who hold his children in vile and damnable <coughs> slavery. Well, Ossibody awesome Brown, well, I've heard you. Are well, you nothing but a common bird and a thief? Now, these are my slaves. Do you intend to steal my property? I don't see any slaves in this arsenal, only free men. Well, you must be blind as well as deaf. Every one of these niggas in here belongs to me. Colonel Washington. Take a look down the barrels of this shotgun. <laughs> Go on. Take your time. Have a good long look and tell me if you see any slaves in there. 
Well, I reckon you don't see any slaves, do you? The reason I've taken you as a prisoner of war is this. In the event that we're overrun by federal troops, you will guarantee my life. If I die, you die. Well, I turned his knees to jelly. A couple of my boys had to help him sit down. Shortly afterward, the first tragedy of this war occurred. My son Watson shot a man who had failed to respond to his command of halt. Shot him right through the lung and he died coughing up his own blood. That man was Hayward Shepard, a recently freed slave who was on his way to work as a baggage master at Harpers Ferry train station. He was deaf, so he could not have heard Watson's command. The first man to die in this holy war to free the slaves was himself a slave. My heart broke when I heard that news. Then I heard the sound of marching feet on the bridge, and I saw one of my best men, Dangerfield Newby, crossing the street toward the bridge. And Newby came to Harpers Ferry with me in hopes of freeing his wife and seven children who were still in slavery in Virginia. I raised my arms in greeting and shouted, Newby! Immediately, a volley of musketry rang out from the bridge, and in the next instant, Newby lay flat on his back a gaping hole in his forehead, his brains oozing onto the cobblestones. For a second I stood frozen to the spot in shock and horror. Then I started toward Newby, but my son Oliver grabbed my arm and pulled me back. I quickly recovered my wits and realized that we were in a dangerous, dangerously exposed position. Back into the arsenal, boys! And shortly after we got back, Aaron Stevens approached me. He came around. We have loaded all the guns and ammunition we can carry. Let's get while the getting is good. Uh, but the hostages will come under the fire that is meant for us. But at the very least, we can escape. If we move now, we can make it to that low wall without being seen from the street. And once we climb over it, we can slide down that steep bank to the Potomac River, swim across, and be in Maryland before anyone knows what has happened. I do not like the sound of retreat. Why should we leave? We're holding 40 hostages to bargain our way out if need be. I wanted to end slavery with a minimum of spilt blood. For many hours, I held that entire town under my control. Had I lust for violence, oh, what a swath of blood and gore I could have left at Harper's Ferry. But as it was, it was my boys who did most of the bleeding and dying. Perhaps I should have escaped and survived to fight another day. But God had called me to be faithful to this cause, so retreat was out of, that, was, was out of the question. From that moment, we were doomed. We were surrounded by the Virginia militia, so there was no chance of our fighting our way out. Soon, Colonel Robert E. Lee and Lieutenant Jeb Stewart arrived with a company of United States Marines. All that I could do was pray for a miracle. And when one did not occur, I began to question my own faith in God. I've since come to realize that his glorious plan was for me to fail in order to be taken captive and thus become a martyr in this holy quest against slavery. I sent my son Watson out under a white flag of truce to discuss terms for the hostages. The bastard blew a hole in his back, and he died slowly. Oh, father, Father, please, shoot me through the head, please, 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 I cannot bear the pain. God has put us on this earth to feel pain, and he will release us when he sees fit. I do not approve of your dying at this time, but if you insist on doing so, then please do it like a man. don't think he had it in him. The next morning, Lee and Stewart approached with a hundred Marines. By then there were only six of us left. The rest of my troops had been picked off one at a time in skirmishes with the Virginia militia. Watson had died during the night as, as Oliver. My poor boys, shot to pieces but at least they died at Armageddon, battling for the Lord. 
Father along we'll know all about it. Father along we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, walk in the sun. He'll understand and say, well done. While Colonel Lee satisfied his horse a hundred yards away, Stuart walked right down the middle of the street, waving his handkerchief. Oh, my, but he was a <laughs> pretty little popinjay, all covered head to foot with perfume. Captain Brown? <laughs> Captain Brown? Oh, don't shoot. <laughs> now, what do you want to turn to surrender? In consideration for not burning the town and in compensation for your killing my sons, I demand free passage to Maryland, at which point I will release the hostages. <laughs> now, that's not very much. I said surrender. Now, what more can you offer? Well, for one thing, I could have killed you here now as easy as swatting a fly. I didn't, and I didn't harm any of the hostages any, in any way, even when your cowardly troops ambushed my men under a white flag of truce. Surely that must count for something. Well, that counts for nothing. Now, I demand that you surrender forthwith to the authority of the United States government. The slave pattern criminals who for now control the government have no authority over me. I recognize only the sovereignty of Almighty God. And at that moment, he waved his hat and the Marines charged. It was all over in less than 10 minutes. They battered down the doors with sledgehammers that we were too few to lay down enough effective fire to stop them. I waited by my dead sons as they came through the door with fixed bayonets. I steadied myself and took dead aim. Pour it on them, boys! And my men and I got off a ragged volley, but that was the last shot I ever fired. Then they were on us. They dragged Dolph and Thompson, my son-in-law, out from under a wagon, and pig stuck him through the throat. And Jeremiah Anderson took a bayonet to the belly and watched his guts spill out all over the stone floor. And Stuart Taylor, standing right by me, got a charging blade through the groin, was lifted off his feet, propelled across the room and pinned to the far wall like a butterfly. And in his death agony, he squirmed and wriggled until his body was hanging upside down. Then they came for me, and I jumped to one side just as young Master Stewart tried to split my skull with his sword. Instead, he slashed my arm to the bone, and I went down. And he tried to run me through, but the blade hit my belt buckle and knocked the wind out of me. And I received six stab wounds into my kidney. Then this perfume fop jumped on my chest and began beating my head with the pommel of his sword. By the third blow, I was unconscious. When I woke, I was a prisoner. So farewell, my friends and brethren, for the time has come to go. I must leave you on the dear old battlefield. As I waited my trial, I knew what was in store for me. I would be tried and hanged with the greatest dispatch. Even though I'd been severely wounded by Jeb Stewart's saber, I received neither medical treatment nor a change of clothing. The suit of clothes that I wore to walk into Harper's Ferry will be the same that I will wear to climb the, ga the gallows stairs and in which I will be laid into the black walnut casket which was built for me before my trial even started. Well, my trial began on the afternoon of the day that I was indicted. I was still suffering so badly from my wounds that I could neither stand nor sit, so I was carried into the courtroom on a cot and lay there only half comprehending what was being said. Now, the interest of true justice should have dictated a delay while I recovered, but the gallows and my coffin were already built, and the slave master's bloodlust was up. Well, the state of Virginia brought in witness after witness to prove that my men and I had attacked the arsenal at Harpers Ferry and taken some of the town's leading citizens hostage. Facts which I never tried to deny, but still they droned on and on, desperately establishing evidence I was freely willing to admit to had they but asked. Now, the judge 
would not consider so much as a one day delay to allow my attorneys to arrive from Boston. So I was represented by a very young court appointed lawyer who had never laid eyes on me in his life until he saw me lying on that cot in the courtroom. Your Honor, <clears throat> I rise here today in your court to plead that you grant a summary verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. I am holding many depositions that attest that my client, uh, 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 Mr. Brown, is suffering from an hereditary mental disease. Now, a Mr. Sylvester H. Thompson, who has been intimately acquainted with the defendant for 20 years, disposes and states that both, both Mr. Brown's mother and maternal grandmother died insane. That Mr. Brown is overwrought on the topic of slavery and insane man on the subject. Now, Mr. Thompson knows the accused to be a man of pure morals and high integrity, but that his once balanced mind has been unsettled by the wrongs of the slave owners, and his mania looks toward avenging these wrongs on those who are their authors. <sighs> See, that's the trouble with lawyers. <laughs> They're apt to butcher the cow that they should have kept to the milking. Well, I'm sure that my attorneys would have considered it a great victory if I had been declared unfit and sent to an institution for the rest of my days. See, they gave no thought to the anti-slavery movement and what would have happened to it had its most radical leader been declared mentally deficient. Of course, the uh, state vigorously contested the insanity claim. They fought this one defense that could have surely stopped the movement dead in its tracks. Well, not being fully recovered at this point, I allowed this foolishness to continue far longer than I should have, but finally I raised myself up from my cot. Your Honor, I reject this insanity plea out of hand. I am not mentally deficient. This is nothing more than a miserable artifice and pretext on the part of those who should defend me in a manner of which I approve, and I view it with contempt. Yes, I knowingly and willingly led an action to free slaves. Of course, the jury convicted me after deliberating for less than an hour. Then Judge Richard Parker pronounced sentence. John Brown, have been found guilty of the charges brought against you. I therefore sent you for the crimes of murder and treason, life imprisonment for the crime of consorting with Negro slaves to be hung by the neck until you are dead and may God have mercy on your soul. I have, may it please my judges, a last word to say. In the first place, I never did intend murder or treason, only freedom for those held in bondage. Had I so interfered on behalf of the rich and powerful or on behalf of any of their friends, it would have been deemed an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. And this court claims to acknowledge the law of God. At least I saw a book kissed in this courtroom that was supposed to be the Bible. That book teaches me that all things men would do to me I should do even unto them. It further admonishes me to remember them that are in bonds, as I am bonded with them. All that I have done is to attempt to live up to these instructions, and I believe to have interfered, as I have done, was no wrong, but right. God's right. The scaffold holds no terror for me. Let them hang me. I forgive them. They know not what they do. I go to a rosy dawn and a better day, but they must do battle with demons that they have created. I'm bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. The men who were captured with me were not afraid either. John A. Copeland, a free black and a graduate of Oberlin College, expressed his feelings during his trial. 
I will not shame my dead companions. They died brave men. I trust I will do the same. You might say, it was foolish of me to throw away my life in such a rash venture. But Captain Brown possesses that strange power that allows him to hold sway over many. If he asked me to walk through the fiery furnace and spit in Nebuchadnezzar's face, I would do it with no questions asked. He is truly one of God's commanders. Besides, you know nothing of slavery. I know a great deal. It is the crime of crimes. Governor Henry A. Wise of Virginia came to visit me during my imprisonment. Well, the man was in a terrible dilemma. The slave oligarchy screamed for my blood. Now, Wise had ambitions to become a candidate for the presidency in 1860. Well, now, were I not promptly executed, uh, his southern followers would object. But to show any degree of leniency would undermine any hope of support from other regions of the country. But as it turned out, he would rather see me hang than to become president. Uh, Captain Brown, uh, you are a dying man, if not from your wounds, then certainly in the very near future as a result of your trial. Now, it uh, suits my political interests uh, to save your life. You could help me do that by uh, uh, renouncing your actions. Otherwise, it would behoove you to prepare for death. Governor Wise, we shall all die, yourself included, at a time and a place that God wills. It would behoove you to prepare for that moment as well. You are hanging me because I've given my life to the freeing of millions of God's children from slavery. Look to your own soul, sir. Well, surely you must have some regrets concerning your actions. I regret only my, I regret only my failures and my mistakes. I have no apologies to make, nor concessions to beg. I would do it again had I the chance. Only the next time I would take care to have at my side the children of David Walker, to St. Louverture and Nat Turner. <laughs> I have heard, sir, that the abolitionist militia by the thousands already in the state of Virginia who intend to help you escape from prison. I doubt not that uh, what you hear is correct. You need not fear yet, for I have communicated my wishes that they not do so. I am worth inconceivably more to hang than for any other purpose because my martyrdom will be the inspiration for that baptism of blood that will finally wash away the sin of slavery from this nation. The hour of my death cannot come soon enough. Hmm. <laughs> uh, Captain Brown, I, I need to restore a climate of domestic tranquility among the citizens of Virginia. Now what can you do for me that, what can I do for you that will make you help me achieve this? Governor Wise, I know you intend to see me executed, but rather than being hung like a common criminal, I would prefer to be shot like a soldier or nailed to a cross like our savior. I would consider it an act of kindness on your part if you would make it possible. Well, Captain Brown, now I don't believe that the uh, penal code in the state of Virginia allows any crucifixions, uh, but out of respect for your lofty status of being a commander in chief of a 19 man army, I'm sure that we can work out a compromise. Maybe you'd prefer to be hung between two niggers. I know that you intend that as an insult, but I consider it the greatest compliment that I've ever been paid. And you remember, Mr. Brown, that the wages of sin is death. And by the way, what wages did you offer your men? None, sir. They fought for the love of the oppressed. And after you have hanged me, oh please, do not allow any blaspheming prayers to be read over my rotting corpse by any of your white supremacist preachers with the blood of slaves dripping from their vestments. We have nothing further to discuss. North and south, the fire shall roll high by me. North and south, the fire shall roll high by me. North and south, the fire shall roll. How will it be with your poor soul? by that old rock of ages left for me. A reading from a letter. Although vengeance is not mine, I confess I feel grateful now that I know that your fiendish career is over. 
Maybe now you can appreciate my distress on that night that you and your men entered my house and destroyed my family butchering. No, that is not the way it was. I am not a terrorist. I struck a blow for freedom in 1856. Those seven Kickapoo Rangers were savages, fully deserving of their fate. Kansas, oh bloody Kansas was no place for a compromise in 1856. Southern politicians tried to make Kansas into a slave state. Popular sovereignty, my foot, importing drunkards from the slums of southern cities to vote for slavery. Now she calls me a terrorist, but I am an anti-terrorist. Pro-slavery terrorists for years had their way in the western territories, murdering with impunity any who dared so much as a whisper of opposition to slavery. Now how many abolitionists were murdered and no legal recourse taken, no investigation, no trial, no justice. My family was widely known to be abolitionists. Members of my family were openly harassed and threatened for their lives in the streets of Pottawatomie, Kansas. It was my beholden duty to defend my family. And my sons and I, we went to Kansas to resist the pro-slavery terrorists. We formed a militia and we stopped them at the Battle of Blackjack. Now, 25 of us defeated a force of some 275 and we chased those marauders all the way back to Missouri. But they soon retaliated. Under a banner proclaiming the supremacy of the white race, a thousand of those demons burned the town of Lawrence because it was the center of the abolitionist activity in that part of the West beating people, brutally murdering seven innocent citizens. And President James Buchanan, a hired hand of the slave-owning lobby, placed a bounty of $250 on my head. So, <coughs> as a reflection of my admiration for that damned old sinner, I put a price of $2.50 upon his. But things got worse. I was hunted by the law, nothing to eat, and I had to learn to sleep in the saddle. And several of my militia boys, including my son John Jr., got captured at Prairie City, Kansas. They were forced to walk many miles barefoot and in chains. They threw John Jr. into a filthy cell and beat him with rifle butts and tortured him. Tortured hideously tortured him until his mind became completely unhinged. I burned to strike back at them. We had to defend ourselves. My chance came when I addressed a gathering of free staters calling for revenge against the Kickapoo Rangers. Now, they were all opposed to slavery, but one man shouted, Oh, we don't want no niggers in Kansas, free or slave. It is not the poor black slave who is your enemy. It is the rich white slave owner. It is not enough for him to have his black slaves as sinful as that is. Oh no, he wants to consign you to the hell of his serfdom as well. Because as soon as slavery enters this territory, wages for honest labor will drop to next to nothing and you won't be able to feed your families. Now that is your future under slavery. Well, what can we do about it? You can follow me. You can all follow me. God has anointed me to wreak his vengeance on these murderers who call themselves the Kickapoo Rangers. I will teach these barbarians that we can fight too. I will strike a blow to avenge every death that they have caused. I will end slavery in this nation by any and all means that I find necessary. And here in my pocket, I have a list with seven names on it. Seven of their leaders, uh, uh, five of, the, of their leaders, five who do not deserve to ever again see the light of day again. I do not shrink from us what must be done. The sight of blood gives me no pause, for there can be no remission of sin without the spilling of blood. On a clear night later that spring and under a beautiful crescent moon, I led my sons, Owen, Oliver, Salmon, and Frederick, into a murky marshland known as the Swamp of the Swan. They were armed with pistols and magnificent broadswords. 
sent to us by our supporters in Ohio. Along with a sword, I carried a double-barreled 12-gauge shotgun. We were ready for God's work. Soon we came to the house with the first name on my list, James Doyle. He and two of his sons were members of the Kickapoo Rangers. I had had a long conversation with him just two days prior, and he had told me, I had told him that my name was Isaac Smith, and he had said that he was in Kansas to rid the world of those damn Browns. Soon we came to his house. Boys, judgment day is upon the wicked. Now three of you go down the road of peace. Draw your swords and wait. And when you see the imps of Satan coming, cut them down without a moment's hesitation. Whatever you do, do not fire off a gun or we will have every pro-slavery man in this territory down our necks. And when they were in place, Frederick and I smashed through the front door at gunpoint we took the old man and his sons prisoner, and we marched them outside in their night clothes, and I pointed down the road with my shotgun. That way, gentlemen, your destiny awaits you. But what's awaiting for us down there? Couldn't rightly say. Could be heaven, it could be <coughs> hell. Reckon we'll find out soon enough. You deserve to know who I am, Mr. Doyle. Do you remember the conversation we had a few days ago? I sure do remember. With that, I pointed my shotgun at them, and down the road they fled, right into the arms of my boys, who never hesitated. Owen had to chase one of them into the swamp, and when he caught it, he decapitated him with one stroke. Next on my list was Alan Wilkinson. He was worse than the Doyles, a vile smelling 300 pound tub of rancid lard. We dragged him naked from his bed, sobbing and blubbering into the road in front of his cabin, where Oliver slit his fat throat from ear to ear with his great sword. He made a child like gurgling as the sound, as his blood of his foul life squirted into the dust. Then we dragged Dutch Bill Sherman from the back of his filthy saloon, more fit for the habitation of swine than for human beings. He was so drunk he could barely stand. At first, he didn't know what was in store for him and we dragged him down to the creek, and I commanded him to wade in. Yeah, that water's cold. Why you want me to get in that creek? So that we can wash our swords when we finished with you. Oh, good God of man. You ain't fixing to do what I think you fixing to do, is you, mister? Please, please, for the love of God, have mercy on me. I have no mercy on enemies of God and no time to waste on a coward like you. And with that, I kicked him down the embankment into the creek and my boys were on him in a flash. And, with, and within moments, the creek ran a pure crimson. Then a delicate pig finally, all traces of his polluted blood were washed away and the water flowed clean and pure again. That night, we changed America forever. Before then, not a single hand had been raised to oppose the shame of our nation. And after this sacrament in the swamp, oh, how joyfully I made wars, war on the minions of Satan and slavery. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Crying holy unto the Lord, crying holy unto the Lord. If I could, I surely would stand on that rock where Moses stood. As I waited the appointed day, I received many letters. Most were from supporters of family members, but one came from another quarter. Mrs. Mahala Doyle, the widow of James Doyle, one of the men that we had executed that night in Kansas. Reading the letter. Although vengeance is not mine, I confess I feel grateful now that I know that your fiendish career is over. Maybe now you can appreciate my distress on that night when you and your men entered my house and destroyed my family, butchering my hu husband and sons like so many hogs to slaughter. Oh, how it pained my heart to hear their dying groans. My consolation comes from my hope and trust that you will meet your just reward in the world to come. You said you did it to free the slaves, but that was a lie. We never owned no slaves and never expected to own none. 
all you did was make me a poor disconsolate widow and ever since that dark night I've prayed for your eternal damnation if this scroll gives you any consolation you are welcome to it I have read this letter many times over these past few days I cannot deny that her grief stings my soul is it God's will that I should be the agent of her suffering yet in my every prayer and meditation, the voice of Jehovah shouts in my ear, the evil of slavery is total and it cannot be vanquished by partial measures. Yesterday, the last full day of my life, my wife Mary came to see me here in the cell. Oh Mary, you're here at last, praise be. I was appalled. The prison was overrun with humanity of every description. I had to face the rude questions of a swarm of newspaper reporters and the insults of slavery-loving Southerners. I was forced ne to negotiate with prison officials concerning the disposition of my husband's dead body. But the worst was John's physical appearance. He was dirty and disheveled and seemed to tremble with a sort of fever, and his coat was little more than a collection of dust and rags. I insisted that the jailer clean it to some degree of a civilized standard. That was the very least they could do under the circumstance. I'm sorry, Mary, I'm so sorry. My failures haunt me. I regret I have lived so many years and yet done so little to increase the amount of human happiness in this world, especially among my family. Try to forgive me for leaving you alone in the coming years. Of course I forgave him. There was no need even for him to ask, but yet I still was troubled. Many were eager to help him escape execution, yet he would not let them. I did not understand why. Mary, most men live only for material comforts and self-aggrandizement and die for no particular reason other than to pay a debt to nature. I have been privileged to live and die for a great cause, but the path to victory lies through the scaffold. When it's over, Mary, take me home and let me lie at peace in the fields. Mark my grave as they do a common sleeves and let my requiem be a spiritual freedom. Farewell, Mary. We shall not meet again in this world. Ah, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell someone of Jesus. You can say he died for all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin. writing the letter he was writing in the beginning. My work is done. It is finished. The day of reckoning is at hand. Well, the jailer came for me as I was staring out the window at the countryside. Uh, Captain Brown, everything's ready. I, I've come to get you. Now, you can ride in the wagon, but you'll have to sit on your cask. I mean, that, uh, it's a black walnut box. Hey, what, what are you thinking about this morning? This is beautiful country. I don't think I've had the pleasure of seeing it before. 
you're not very much afraid, are you, sir? No. Life is hard, but the leaving of it is easy. I lost my mother when I was eight, and since that day, I felt alone and abandoned in this world, so being shut of it is no cause for concern. Fear not and trust in the Lord. Yeah. Well, do you have anything to say before we go? Yes, I would like to thank you for your kindness. And as I was led down the steps of the jail, a young slave mother approached me. Captain Brown, anoint this child. Oh, Lord, I never thought I'd live long enough to see a white man put his lips on the lips of a black face. I hope this child lives a long time so she can testify that you've done it before they went and nailed you to a tree. I'm in the way, the bright and shiny way. I'm in the glory land way, telling the world that Jesus is my king. I'm in the glory land way. News. I am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but by blood. I had vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed it might be done. <coughs> you have sown the wind. Now you will reap the whirlwind. And if it is now deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of justice and mingle my blood with the blood of my sons and the blood of millions of slaves whose rights and lives have been disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, then I submit, then I say, let it be done. News. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fearful lightning of his terrible good sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, a paper and I read from it and I say, tomorrow when they place his remains aboard the train, that will be the last that we will hear of this Osawatomie Brown. Robert E. Lee. Thank you. <laughs>